by the group, by our group at the Humboldt University of Berlin, and Alex Nipomnichi from Technion in Israel. This project was supported by German Israeli Foundation. Um, <clears throat> Uh, all of us know that large-scale turbulent flows feature complicated dispersion for particles, passive and active. Well, uh, on large scales, of, uh, well, on, <coughs> on moderate, uh, large uh, spatial and temporal scales, diffusion, normal diffusion dominates. But if you have uh, <coughs> Coherent structures in your flow, you may easily obtain anomalous transport properties. And here, we would like to show that such anomalous transport properties can be observed in, without turbulence. So I will show a few examples. So first, without any noise, deterministically. The flows are animal uh, laminar. So these are just flows past vortices, soft obstacles, and past hard obstacles solid obstacles. And then I will also, in the end, I hope, hopefully I'll have some time for that introduce noise, and show how the uh, intermediate time scales are affected by anomalies. So let me start with, yeah, okay, this is an important remark here. So I have anomalous transport. There is neither molecular diffusion, there are no fluctuations nor even Lagrangian or Eulerian chaos there. Everything is quite regular, and nevertheless, you will see that the results are not as somewhat surprising. So this is probably redundant in this audience, so just the basics of fluid motion. I just also would like to focus. There is a Eulerian description, so everything is fixed locally, or you let your observation devices float with a, with a tracer, and then you have the Lagrangian picture. And of course, for transport, the Lagrangian one is much more convenient. And that's probably the reason why our talk was shifted in the program from the Euler Hall to this particular place. Of course, there it would be bad in the place. So again, what do we call here normal transport? So we take an ensemble of particles. And if the variance in that ensemble grows linearly with time, we say it's normal diffusion. If it goes slower, we call it subdiffusion. If it goes faster, we say it's super diffusion. OK. And then, to make the things quite simple, I go to the plane, to dimensional flows, and I discard time dependence. So for Eulerian observer, for Eulerian observer this would be boring and trivial. For Lagrangian observer, Const uh, the velocity is constant in every point, and this means that the, your phase space turns into the, uh, your plane turns into a phase plane of a dynamical system. And a tracer moves along this plane, along the phase trajectory. So we have incompressible fluid, a two-dimensional steady flow. This means phase volume there is conserved. And when you introduce a stream function, it plays a role of Hamiltonian. So fluid particles are carried along the isolines of Hamiltonian. And if you know this Hamiltonian or stream function, well, it's an integrable Hamiltonian system. So in principle, you should not expect especially uh, complicated things. And this is just two-dimensional, your phase space. So there is no chaos, neither uh, Eulerian nor Lagrangian. Well, I will consider forced flows on a unit square with periodic boundary conditions. In five minutes, I will explain you why I need this geometry. Now, you take it just as it is. So a square with periodic boundary conditions is a two-dimensional torus. So I impose periodic boundary conditions. Yeah. And I would like to have mean drift. So there is some forcing there. I would like this ratio between the rates of drift to be irrational for the reasons which we will have, which we will see later. And the forcing term is spatially periodic, is constant in time. And let it be very simple, trigonometric, sinusoidal in x and sinusoidal in y. So you can write down this forcing term in the Navier-Stokes equations, and you can write out an explicit solution of that equation. And you will see that when you increase the amplitude, so if there's no amplitude, you have straight streamlines. When you increase the amplitude, you have, you have 
Aha. You have a topological transition. So from straight streamlines which cover the whole square or a torus, you see how the vortices are formed. And then, after that, you have a mixed phase space. So you have still streamlines which go around the torus or along the square if you lift it onto a plane, and you have isolated vortices. And those vortices are encircled by separate races of stagnation points. The bifurcation finds, uh, takes place here, where you get a turning point. This turning point then uh, dissolves into two, uh, an elliptic point in the middle of the vortex and a stagnation point, a hyperbolic stagnation point there. OK, so that's how it comes. And there you had, here you have two vortices. And OK, one of them was rotating clockwise, the other, the other one was counterclockwise rotating. You may take a similar stuff with a little bit more complicated forcing pattern, and then you get co-rotating vortices. And from the transport point of view, there is a difference, as we shall see in a couple of minutes. So OK, now let's uh, compare, let, let the tracer move, be carried along this velocity field. And then we see there is an interesting property there. If you have a look at the spectrum of the velocity, Fourier spectrum of the velocity carried uh, by this flow, then you will see if there are no eddies, this is a quite usual discrete Fourier spectrum. It's a quasi-periodic process. So you just have those dense countable set of delta functions. But if you have, but if you have uh, vortices on your flow, you have a different picture. You have this complicated pattern and it can be shown this is neither discrete not absolutely continuous with respect to, say, to the Lebesgue measure. It is singular continuous. It is supported by the fractal set of the frequency values. And there you also have an unusual behavior of uh, autocorrelation. So you know that, OK, so you can take the measure the autocorrelation function for the passive tracer in that flow, and you see this autocorrelation decays. It decays, although you have an explicit integral, the stream function, so a decay of correlations in an integrable system. Now, OK, we know that, in principle, as ergodic theory tells us, transfer is a spectral property. So if you have those unusual things in the spectrum, you may expect something interesting in the transport. And indeed, now let's, first let's quantify the transfer. So let's take the variance. So all particles are uh, uh, <clears throat> carried al uh, along the streamlines. So we take the elongation of the package of the ensemble. And now we introduce it. And just that's mean square, mean square deviation, what we are going to look at. And we see how it goes. It, for counter-rotating vortices, it so in, bo in both cases, it seems to grow. For counter-rotating vortices, it grows reasonably slow. Here it goes faster. In both cases, it goes, well, the slope is lower, definitely lower as 0 0.5. So it is what you would call subdiffusion. Don't pay much attention to those numbers. We will see later that, OK, they should be different. Uh, well, OK. Now I take a different example. Again, a square, I take a lattice of cylinders. This is actually the applied problem. You would like to cool the rods of your reactor. So you let the flow go around it. Now you formulate it again in a similar way. You just take, you discard nonlinear terms. You say it's a Stokes flow, so it's a biharmonic equation. And you would like now to have no slip boundary condition along the whole border. Now your uh, function vanishes on the, now your uh, velocity vanishes on the whole lines. And still, you would like to have periodicity here and mean flow along both axes. You parameterize it in the same way. And that's how your flow then looks like. And then, again, you see that the stream flow lines go around and again. So again, you can show that this, if you uh, study the transport properties of this flow. Just you measure Fourier spectrum, you measure outer correlations, you would see that outer correlations displace power law decay, and the spectrum sits on the fractal set. 
And as for transport, now you see something which looks like a weak superdiffusion, slightly larger than 0 0.6. So that's how the variance in the ensemble of particle grows. Why does it happen? Why do this flow behave that way? Oh, that's pretty easy. So here is the flow around the eddy, here is uh, around one vortex, here is the flow with one obstacle on a square with periodic boundary condition. I take here, uh, ten, let's say 10,000 of tracers and let them drift. And as the time goes on, I see how they are stretched, how they are going around. And well, if I wait sufficiently long here or there, I find my tracer particles everywhere. So there is mixing here in the system. It's weak mixing here. It's a faster mixing there. But in any case, there is mixing. And what is the reason for the mixing? The reason is straightforward. The reason is the passage near the stagnation point. So if here, or, OK, there, the reason is a slow down somewhere. So there are particles which slow down. And there are particles which go elsewhere and at this moment do not experience a slowdown. So these stretches the distances. And for the effect to be strong enough, I need such zones in the flow. That's why I need stagnation points or uh, obstacles where I have such continuous, so to say, of stagnation points. And I need repeated passages close to such zones. And for my repeated passages, I need, well, a two-dimensional torus gives me a perfect geometry for that. With irrational rotation number, I come arbitrarily close to any given point, including those things. So if I, I have an isolated, so the passage time across the square, across the unit, it has a logarithmic singularity in the case of isolated stagnation point, and it has a power law singularity in the case, a stronger singularity in the case of the continuum of stagnation points, in the case of the solid obstacle. And then, uh, and then you would like to have a look at the transport, and then you realize this is a slow effect. And for it to be observed, you need, a, you need something better than indeed the Stokes equation or the Navier-Stokes equations. Although you have your explicit solutions, you won't observe, you won't get reliable numbers from a thousand of iterations around the torus. Not neither from 10,000. You need something like millions and tens of millions. But uh, solving uh, Stokes equations or Navier Stokes equations for that time is not very reliable. You get errors which accumulate. You need a model which works much better. And there is such model. It was, OK, so just, it's indeed, it's very straightforward introduction of that model. So what you have there is a non-random walk over the lattice. So you see the, there is a streamline. For example, this red streamline, sometimes it goes relatively fast across the square. Sometimes it comes close to the border. And then it hovers for some time. The mapping, which you would like to uh, introduce here from a border onto the next border. It's straightforward. It is just a circle mapping. So for y, for the vertical coordinate, it's just a shift. And here it's a circle mapping. And alpha to beta is a rotation number. But you need somehow to incorporate the time uh, for an itera iteration of this mapping. So you need somehow in the dynamics to take into account the fact that this mapping here occurred pretty, uh, this iteration occurred pretty fast, and that one close to the, close to the obstacle took quite a lot of time. When you compute transport properties or spectra or correlations, you average over trajectories. And therefore, such passages, such close passages, they have bigger contributions. They have bigger weight in those things. And you need to take that eff effectively into account and there is such construction in ergodic theory, which is known as a special flow. It was introduced, uh, well, OK, it was introduced by von Neumann. Uh, so let me say that's how it is. It's just uh, piecewise, piecewise continuous dynamical system. 
So you start for some, uh, so y now plays the role of time. You start in some point of x, you, and you move here with constant x and constant velocity until you hit somewhere the border curve. You hit it and then instantaneously you make a jump. You iterate your circle mapping. And then you start your mo motion again until you hit the curve. And then you make a jump again. So the mapping here can be your circle mapping. And the border curve is your passage time past the obstacle. And you see this passage time can be bounded in the case where you do not have singularities or it can be unbounded if you have stagnation points or stagnation zones. This, this construction was, as I say, introduced uh, over eight years ago by von Neumann. And now it is straightforward to see what kind of singularities we need there. It's a very simple construction which, er which allows to, com well, to compute 10 to the power of 12, 10 to the power of 14 of iterations in a reasonable time. So for general, for general saddles, these are uh, logarithmic singularities for generic saddles. For non-hyperbolic saddle points, you have singularities of the power like that's how they look like. So that's the normal form for your bifurcation, depending on, your, on the degree of your degeneracy, n. And n sits here. So you see all those kappas are smaller than 1 over 2. So these are powerless singularities, and they are weak powerless singularities. And finally, for the flows like that, where you have a continuum of stagnation point, you can write uh, you can get, take the explicit solution of the uh, Stokes equation. High order terms you need to get from this isolated square a lattice. But from this stuff, you can already estimate the passage time. So if x0 is the entrance of the separate x, which hits exactly the cylinder here, then your passage time diverges like an uh, inverse square root law. And then you can play for example, with logarithmic singularities with a special flow. And that, this is the result which you obtain there. So the growth is non-monotonic. And this is remarkable. This is not diffusion. So there are uh, the ensemble stretches and shortens again, and stretches and shortens again. And if you take the golden mean rotation number, the minima correspond, build the Fibonacci progression and they correspond to the best rational approximations to your rotation number. If you take the power laws, well, that's what you get. So you get the power law, and numerically, the exponent which you get there is just the double kappa, the double uh, exponent of the singularity. This is still subdiffusion. So you, and you can, so we made a theory which estimates that exponent. And we show that it indeed goes for a special flow. It's such a simple dynamical system that there you can obtain the closed expressions for that. And there you see that after a certain time, you indeed, you indeed observe a subdiffusive process. Okay, now this doesn't work for uh, stronger power law singularities and there, we made a different approximation. So let's say a point, it's indeed a special flow, but the mapping which sits down there is not a circle, simple circle mapping. It's a random circle mapping. So altogether, you have the uh, CTRW, uh, so the object which was discussed today in a lecture of Sergei Fedotov, and this is continuous time random walk. And there's a well-established mathematical apparatus how to deal with such things. And you see, the second moment of the distribution goes like three minus, so after, after you make the, all the necessary Laplace transformations, you get the number three minus one over kappa. And kappa is larger, if kappa is larger than one over two, this exceeds one, this is super diffusion. So altogether, these two lines, subdiffusion for kappa below one over, uh, one half and super diffusion up there, they match 
in this point. So you have here uh, subdiffusive, slow diffusion. Here, there you have super diffusive processes. Exactly in that point, uh, the prefactor in the integral diverges. So there is a different. You can, uh, again, you can make a limit uh, transformation, and then you observe the. You see there, the second moment grows like t logarithm of t. And indeed, it is well supported by our numerics. Uh, by the way, this transport is also monofractal, uh, multifractal. So if you have a look at higher moments, so the continuous time random work gives you this scaling. It goes like that. There is a term which does not depend on n. And this term provides multifractality. Indeed, this can be also uh, confirmed by numerical things. One thing maybe here in the end, you go back to the logarithmic thing, to the logarithmic transport. You remember th there were those returns. If you have a closer look, you see they happen here at the moments which correspond to Fibonacci returns. And so in the logarithmic time scale, it looks like a lattice of such returns. And again, it seems that this interval here reminds the larger one. This one is, has more inside it, but the next has still more inside it. But altogether, there is some degree of similarity. So let's try to map all of them onto each other. And you start with one interval, then you take a curve from the next interval, from the next interval, from the next, and you see how you are getting a more and more complicated object with the minima at the same places. So it looks like a generation of a fractal. It's generation of a fractal in real time. Variance behaves like a fractal. So uh, I do not have time now to talk about uh, noise. Uh, you know, you can, eat, okay, you, but you can do it here, of course. If you introduce noise in a usual Langevin way, this white noise, for example, here, and you add it to the cellular flow there, then a typical trajectory looks like that. So it's, again, it's a CTRW, but with an additional complication. Due to the cellular structure inside, you know there is a circular motion there. So the traps there, they have internal dynamics. And this can be done, this can be computed. So we also observe, of course, noise here ensures that in the end, at big times, at sufficiently big times, you get normal diffusion. But there is a lot of different intermediate regimes which can be subdiffusive, which can be super diffusive somewhere. It depends now at intermediate time scales where you start, in the, in the middle of the AD or close to the separatrix. If you start near the separatrix, the initial motion is ballistic. If you start near the center, the initial transport is diffusive, and then you have a hyperballistic transient. And, if you, and this is, okay, you de it depends on initial condition. This means you have a property of aging, and this aging is non-monotonic here. So we also provided the theoretical estimates for that, which was reasonably good matched by our numerics. We also made some computations uh, for, no, for, for the noisy cat eyes, cat's eyes flow. Cat's eyes, this means that you have a parameter here where you proceed, from a, which helps you to proceed from a cellular flow to jets. And the jets correspond to the transport mode of a Levy walk and the a confined motion in an eddy is a trapping event. So altogether, if you match all that, uh, then you obtain different transport to genes at intermediate time scales. Well, you, you also observe interesting aging properties. All that can be found in an, our recent paper in Physical Review E and for the cat's eyes flow in our ARCSIF. And summarizing, I would like simply to say, even the flows with very simple temporal structure may have highly non trivial transport properties. And uh, they can be 
captured by a reasonably simple mathematical model, a special flow, which gives you some exact values in the end. So thank you for your attention and for your patience.